uh, we've been in a series, which I'm going to wrap up today, called Fighting for Relevance. And one of the, one of the things that the, the recent growth and new faces, new families have done for all of us on the team is, as I look out into the audience on any given weekend, uh, I don't know everybody. I don't know everybody that well. I'm, I'm getting to know you. We're getting to know one another. But one of the things that uh, you have to be careful on is assuming, assuming that people know who certain people are. I can't, I can't be, it's not safe any longer for me just to say, just see Joe Schmo after service because half of you are going to go, who's Joe Schmo? Or the words that we use and the, the messages that come across this platform have to be in a way that are going to reach as broad of an audience as possible meaning that there are individuals in this service and the previous service and the coming service on Monday that are in different stages of, of life, uh, exposure to Christianity, uh, exposures to different um, denominations or even religious traditions. And so we thank you for taking the journey with us. And so let me explain as I dive in today, fighting for relevance. I, I believe that the most relevant message in the entire universe is the message of Jesus. Yet how we package that, how we communicate that, how we live that is something that we're fighting for, fighting for relevance in our culture, in a, in a world that is, is looking for answers and the church needs to, and I believe is going to shine bright in darkness. Can I get an amen on that? So we came out of 2020 and many people have, have had varying suffering that happened during the, the 2020 pandemic. And I know we're kind of, maybe we, some would say we're still in that. But so what I'm about to say, I want to be very honorable. I realize there are individuals that potentially lost loved ones or businesses that didn't recover. But I've had people come to me and say, well, wasn't 2020 the worst year of your life? And, and I, I can tell you it absolutely was not. Um, I've had way worse years than 2020, but I will say this, 2020 was the weirdest, right? How many agree that 2020 was just weird? It, it was weird. And we, 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 not only did we survive it, church, we thrived in it. In 2020, we, we not only moved, but purchased and renovated a building. We continued to expand and grow. But I remember during the early process of things shutting down and we were hundreds of thousands of dollars invested already in a building program and construction stopped. And I had to fight these imaginations and thoughts and concerns like, you know, there's no backing out of this now. And then we went online and for a, for a little while, it seemed to be effective. But things began to transition after uh, watching a screen or a television or a broadcast of a sermon or a message or even worship. How many know there's a difference between uh, praying for somebody and praying with somebody? You know, I've been, I was praying for you. Our team was praying for you. And we were worshiping to the best of our abilities in our living rooms and experiencing God to the very best of our ability. But it's different when you gather with the saints of God under one roof and we worship God together. It's different when you need prayer or ministry that might look like altar time, but it could look like a smile as you came walking in because the week was heavy. And a friend of mine who pastors in another area, we were talking about the change, the impact that this pandemic or 2020 had on the church culture at large, the body of Christ around the country. And he said this statement with full conviction and with, with, with uh, real tenacity in his tone. He said, I believe that church attendance, as we knew it before, will never be the same. And I said to him with conviction and a tone of tenacity, I 100% disagree. I do not agree that attendance in church will never be the same. I discovered this about myself. I wonder if you can relate that when we, uh, when we take the gathering for granted, maybe some of us did just showing up on Sundays or, a, or for different gatherings, I, I will never take the gathering together and the human touch and the need for the church again. And, and I believe what it did is it showed us how important the human touch is, which is really where I want to go today, fighting for relevance. You and I, as we talked about last week, are created in the likeness and the image of God. And God has uh, designed us for community because God himself is communal. It's in the fabric of our being to be around people. There are studies about infants Failure to thrive. If you don't touch or care for a child in an appropriate way, they can physically die without having that kind of touch. There's a certain segment of time where people can be isolated by themselves before you go mad, 
We need to have people around us in order to be healthy and to thrive because that is what God has placed within us. It's, it's who we are. It's the, it's the extension of God's personality in the body of Christ, the church. Let's go back to Genesis chapter one, the, the opening statements of our Bible. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I want to, I want to put this out there, that God knew what it was like to not have you around and he didn't like it. God is really interested in you being here, being present, being fully you. There's an idea among Christian conversations that, that God really can't stand you. He wants you to be erased. Well, God had that in the beginning and he liked it better. So he created space for you. God wants you to be fully engaged with him. He's looking for union with you. He's looking for oneness with you. And so God, who is communal, has, has demonstrated even from the beginning that it wasn't okay with him not to have you, not to have his creation. And so we began to create a space. The story throughout the scriptures, you, you see God continually increasing or ramping up this idea of coming near, being close. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter seven, verse number 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. It is who God is to be close, to be near. We do not have a God who's cosmic and removed. We have a God who understands humanity. What we're gonna read here in a moment that he so understands your frailty, your challenges, that he put on skin. He, he came near, he's working closer and closer to ultimately, we'll read about the Holy Spirit, who then indwells us. You don't get any closer than the indwelling of the God presence in your, in your life. Hebrews chapter four, the writer says, he understands humanity. For as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way, just as we are, and he conquered sin. So we see this building uh, anticipation of God coming near. He is communal. He's really interested in you knowing him and him knowing you and developing and growing in revelation and consciousness of who he is. But let's go back to the creation story one more time. You see, God creates the stars and the sun and the earth and the cosmos. And then he, he puts it, a moon around a, a sun and then a planet around it. And he tilts it and he creates the, 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 the plant life and they're, they're reproducing of their own kind with seed. And then the animal kingdom. And then he makes this perfect garden and he puts man, Adam, there. And Adam is, is naming all these animals. And he notices a pattern that there's male and female so that even in the animal kingdom, they can reproduce. And it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18, the Lord God said, it is not good. Someone say not. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Please notice that it did not say that Adam was lonely. God said it just wasn't good for him to be alone. We know that God was communicating and having relationship with Adam, but it was not good for man to be alone. That's why I'm convinced that we may see fluctuations in, in church attendance, but the gathering together is something that's in the very fabric of our being. Let's fast forward now to the New Testament, the establishing of the church and how God was working all things out. The terminology that is used is the human body to describe what the, the church looks like. The, the Holy Spirit's ministry, one of the Holy Spirit's ministries is to immerse you into the body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul writes, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. If you read the, the entirety of this chapter, he goes on to give some analogies. Like, like it is, it is, uh, it's not good for the ear to say, I have no use for the mouth. There, there's, there's portions of my human body that I rarely give thought to. 
For example, my pinky toe. I don't give it a lot of thought until I stub it. And then the whole body reacts, right? There's, there's components of my anatomy, the, the, the organs inside that I've never seen, but I'm so grateful that they're functioning well. The same is true as a body of believers. There are ones that are visible. There are ones that have voices, but every one of us make a difference and the components that God has within you and the purpose that God has placed within you is absolutely needed for us to function without handicap. My hand is awesome. I love my hand, but it's useless without my arm, right? It's not gonna pick up anything or retrieve something without the other connected components. And the same is true for you and for me. Now, sometimes we read through the Bible and, and maybe just lack of exposure to the culture or we just become so familiar with it, we read right over it and, and we don't catch the intensity or the impact of a statement. So if we go back to verse number 13, Paul says, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. And then he makes a, a, a distinction, whether you're Jewish or you're Gentile, whether you're a slave or free. These are radical statements. In our, okay, the Hebrew culture, the Jews of the day, Jehovah, Yahweh was their God. They were God's people. And now under this new covenant, Paul is declaring what Jesus has done. It said, there's neither Jew or Gentile. We're all called to one body. Okay, these were hostile people. And I mean, not the, the people, but they, how they treated one another. Hebrews or Jews, they wouldn't even go eat dinner with a Gentile. I mean, the apostle Peter, if you read the story in Acts, he was wrestling with the fact that God gave him a vision to go eat a, go eat a pig. And he was saying the same is true. Don't call something unclean that I've called clean. And then he sends them to the Gentiles to go minister the gospel. So in one body, we're going to have people of different cultures and thoughts that God has called us to work together. The other example that he gave, and we don't necessarily resonate with this because it's been hundreds of years since we've been dealing here in America with, with slavery, but he says in the body of Christ, neither slave nor free. Uh, imagine if you could, if it's possible that in one moment, a slave owner has now released his slave and God called them both to the same body. I would say that would cause or be cause for some tension. Now the one that I've been giving orders to has equal and, and uh, value and rights and say, and they, they are just as important as the one who once previously, previously owned them. Do you, it's hard to understand because I've never owned a human, right? And I'm not making light of that. But what, what would it look like? What, would, what could we write in this story that maybe would resonate a little bit for us because we're called to one body. And by the way, not everyone here thinks alike. Not everyone here believes alike. What if, what if Paul were to say, neither Republican or Democrat? What if he was to say, mask or no mask? Vaccine, no vaccine. What if he said black or white? What if he said, no North or South, no native or immigrant? We are called to one body with different backgrounds and ideas and, and, and sociological and economical uh, variances, yet we're called to one body. He, here's what I wrote down for you to consider. Conflict is inevitable, but peace is optional. Pastor Duane once said to me, I don't know, probably a decade ago, he, he, that people are crazy. And I, I thought, Pastor, you probably shouldn't say that. But now, 10 years later, people are crazy, <laughs> right? And I, I can say that because sometimes I'm crazy. Sometimes I'm off. Sometimes people do strange things. People think different things. People will let you down. People will think differently. And yet we're called to one body. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God peacemakers. Conflict is inevitable, but peace is optional. In John chapter 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples, Christians. And he starts out the chapter with, 
him being the vine and, and we being the branches. And, and if we stay and abide in him, the blessing of God is on our lives. And, and then he says, if you, if you just keep my commandments, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then he tells us what the commandment is. In John 15, 12, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. He's talking to Christians. So this applies to us. He said the greatest commandment, the whole kiss thing was perfect. He didn't even know I was going to go this way. The greatest commandment, the commandment is love one another as he has loved you. Just a, maybe a week ago, Becky and I were taking a drive and I was lamenting a little bit. Um, ministry can be challenging, uh, to say the least. And, uh, you know, contrary to some popular belief, pastors do a little bit more than just a couple hours on Sunday. Um, and, and during the week, it is not just like, you know, just random kumbaya, uh, breakout acoustic worship in the office, just waiting for someone to bring the next fruit basket in or something. You know, it's hilarious. My, my youngest son came in on spring break about a year ago, and he stopped by Mona's office because the door closed, and he goes, <clears throat> Mona, what does my dad do all day? <laughs> not much, not much. But anyway, uh, it's not just for the pastor. Ministry's hard for us all, right? It's hard because why? People are crazy. Okay, so I'm lamenting to Becky about, you know, some frustration that there have been people that have, have come to us or God led them to us or he intersected our lives that in moments of tragedy, sometimes it's bad decisions, illegal things that have happened and they're, they're looking for help and, and partnering with them, walking them through that. Uh, some people come to mind that, that was financial ruin and we were feeding them and helping them get their, their lives back in order. And in so many cases, we watch God establish and bless and increase their life. And it's so, it's so sad to me that the majority of people that we've helped in this way, essentially, once healed, once, once things are better, thank you, I've got it from here. And I'll tell you why it frustrates me because my hope, my prayer when we help somebody like that, that they would join forces with us and help us duplicate in someone else's life what this local body just did for them, right? And I, and I, I said to Becky, I'm like, Becky, it's just so frustrating that you watch God bless them and their, 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 their lives and their marriages are restored or their businesses are restored or the things in their life are just so different. And, and then they just don't even care about, about helping. And as soon as the words came out of my mouth, it was like I heard myself. And I said to her, oh my goodness, I do that to God all the time. Truth is, we all do. We all have had times where God has delivered us, healed us, set us free, got things in order, and we neglected him. We took it for granted. We kind of went back to our old ways. And this is where Jesus' commandment means a lot, that it is hard. It's hard even in the local church to love people. I believe the only way that we can consistently do this is to be reminded that he loves us even in our mess-ups. Amen? He didn't say just love them. He said, love them as I have loved you. In John chapter 13, Jesus says, by this, everyone, say everyone. everyone. That's everyone when you do the, the, the deep dive into the, the Greek language. Everyone turns out means Everyone. By this, everyone will know you that, that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, if I were to walk around and talk to you privately or go into different venues where Christians are gathering, and I were to ask them, how do you think people would identify you or, or be able to notice that you're a disciple, a follower of Jesus? And it would be interesting to hear the feedback. A lot of it would be, well, Perhaps it's the amount of scriptures that I know or how holy I live. And, and, and then we begin to treat discipleship like a resume that we, that we produce. And then this is, this is my credentials. When Jesus said the one thing that everyone, everyone, say everyone, that everyone will know is how you love each other. Because the challenge of people is everywhere. And this right here, at least we have Jesus at the center and most of us are on a journey and most of us have that in common. And so if we could get it 
together here and maybe carry that same momentum out there because when the world, the unbelieving people come into the church or watch from a distance and we can't get along, well, they don't want to get their, their, into that mess either. And I, honestly, I don't blame them. He said, you'll know that the people, everyone else will know that you're my disciples based on how well you love one another. Amy Stanley wrote a book a few years ago called Irresistible. And the book had such an impact on me that I bought a copy for every family in our church. Um, and just out of curiosity, has anyone here familiar with the book Irresistible or read the book, a few of you? I still stand behind it. I still strongly recommend it. And there's a phrase in, in Andy's book that, that goes like this. What if we just one anothered one another better? Just, what if we just one anothered one another better? And if you were to go through the Apostle Paul's list of one anothering one another, you would find such things as submit to one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, restore one another, accept one another, care for one another, bear with one another, carry one another's burdens. Here's an excerpt from the book. Andy writes, imagine a world where people were skeptical of what we believed, but envious of how well we treated one another. Imagine a world where unbelievers were anxious to hire, work for, work with, live next door to Christians because of how well we one another, one another, and how well we one another them as well. Interesting, as I... It was getting ready this morning. I was praying for you, praying for this message, praying for the service, rereading this excerpt. What if, what if we walked out these doors with this notion that maybe they would be skeptical about your theology, maybe they'd be skeptical about what you believe, but they couldn't deny how well you one anothered one another? And not only the way that you love one another and serve one another and forgive one another, what if we took it back to our neighborhoods and then back on the job on Monday and back into the venues that we find ourselves one anothering one another? Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews is written in the first century, meaning that this challenge of gathering together is not a first world issue. It's a people issue. The writer of Hebrews says in uh, chapter 10, verse number 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I've been criticized for different things that I've said or theologies. Uh, one of the things that kind of shows up a lot is uh, I've been criticized by religious people for being too optimistic, uh, too encouraging, or the grace is being too sloppy. Um, I'll take all of those, by the way. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm guilty as charged. I, I will continue to be encouraging. I will continue to lean on the grace of God, not sloppy, but uh, I, uh, I think grace kind of is sloppy. I think grace is just uh, goes past the the, uh, the mental faculties of what's reasonable. That's why it's called uh, unmerited favor. It's grace, right? Um, I think though what the apostle Paul is saying here is that let us not forsake the gathering of gather together and spurring one another on for good works. Yes, it's part of my responsibility as a pastor to bring a message that, you know what, when you leave here, you feel better about yourself. You're ready to take on the challenges of life again. It's not going to help you any for you to leave here after me beating you up for 30 minutes. You do a good enough job on that yourself, right? Yeah. Anyone else wrestle with the criticisms of self? Yeah. So we, we should, as communicators, pastors, spur you on to good works. But you know what? It also starts with the person who greets you at the door, the two, the two crazy ladies driving Vinny out there, picking you up at your cars, <laughs> right? And I say crazy with the most affection mostly because I'm afraid of Bobby. Uh, 
No, I'm joking. But it's the, it's the person you're sitting next to. It was the usher, the greeter. It's, we spur one another on. And here, here's, here's the thing. So uh, people will tell me occasionally, it kind of goes in cycles, that, you know what, uh, I'm just frustrated with church. I'm, they'll, they'll, they'll say things like, I don't need church to know God. I don't need religion. And I'll tell you this, I've been a Christian for the majority of my life now, almost 30 years I've been a Christian. And I, I have never, never met an individual or a family that de-churched and their spiritual journey got better. Not one time in all of my Christian experience did I find a person, individual or family that said, I'm no longer gonna go do church or be a part of church and their spiritual experience got better. And here's, here's the thing. Yeah, when I talk to people, they're like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually enjoying myself. I, I watch these TV preachers and I'm getting encouraged and I'm getting fed. I, I kind of like sitting on my couch and drinking my coffee and letting them just speak into my life. And, and the truth is, a lot of those TV preachers are people that inspire me as well. And the authors that they're reading really stir me on too. And I get excited. He, here's the challenge. If I'm by myself in my living room watching a TV preacher with my coffee in my cup and I'm not making fun of TV preachers at church because one day we're gonna be on TV. I'm not saying that's all bad. So imagine I'm doing that. Great. I'm getting so fed, so encouraged. But let me ask you, who am I spurring on? Or have I just treated it all about what I get? You see, the relevance is when I both receive and I give. And I can only receive if I'm by myself. There's no one to serve. There's no one to spur on to good works. Good preaching, Pastor Phil. How many know that life gets heavy sometimes, right? Let me show you a video. If you could put that up for me. Cameron is the strongest guy I know. And uh, he's bench pressing right now, repping out 315 pounds. The, uh, the handsome young man behind him is my middle son, Isaiah. And soaking wet, Isaiah weighs 150 pounds. And he is spotting Cameron who is lifting more than twice Isaiah's body weight. And you'll notice as he goes into a couple more reps, pumps out the first one. You see he's slowing down a little bit. And the second one, you'll notice that Isaiah doesn't need to lift all 315 pounds. All the spotter needs to do is help just a little bit in that sticking point. I'm here to remind you or maybe to submit to you that we all need spotters in life. It doesn't require you to carry all of the weight of someone else, just a little bit, just enough to get past that sticking point. I was talking to Cameron when we videoed this. He said, truth is my spotter rarely has to touch the bar. Me just knowing that he's there is enough to help me push out that, that next extra rep. And so when we're, we're all about self, when it's not about just what, uh, or if it's all about what I get from God, that's one-sided. And God, who's communal, showed us that he, in, he created a space for humanity. He, he wove through history where he got closer and closer and closer to being literally inside of you, indwelling you. And if, if we are created in God's image, then we should be ones who are also communal because the blessing of God the anointing of God isn't just for you, it is, it is for others. And in this life, heavy things happen. Challenging things happen to our lives. And I can tell you, I am the product of the rescue of the body of Christ. This is, it has been the saints of God who have spurred me on, who have encouraged me. When I wanted to quit and they came alongside, when we were suffering and going through hardship, they stood with me. This is, my life is not an isolated incident, just me and God. Can I put it out this way? That you can be pro-Jesus and still be anti-Christ. Just let that sink in for a moment. Jesus is the head, but the body of Christ is the church. And so if you are going through this idea that, well, I just, just me and Jesus, I'm sorry. It doesn't work with just the head. You need the body as well. We all do. There are reasons why people will leave a church. And I think there are reasonable reasons. 
But I think there are, there are reasons that are obvious. But let me, let me just say this. I try to announce this at least once, twice a year possibly. That if you in your heart don't resonate or have witnessed by the Holy Spirit that this house, this local church is for you, that this is home, I strongly encourage you to find me after service or, or join with one of our prayer team and we will partner with you. We will pray that God will reveal where you're supposed to be. Because the truth is, if your heart isn't connected, you're not benefiting us or yourself. And truth is, you're robbing another church of the gifting that you have, you're supposed to be there. So we need to help you find that place. But conversely, if this is home and you do resonate in your spirit that this is where you're supposed to be, I'm gonna say this, we need you. We are not complete without you. We are handicapped without you. We're not serving to the very best of our ability if you're, you're just hanging out. We need you to be a part of this body. We all need spotters in this life. When you walked in, you should have received a three by five card and a small pencil like this. If for some reason you did not get one, um, I'd like ushers, we've got some here. I just need, uh, if you didn't get one, it's important that you do. So if you didn't get one, you came in, could you slip up your hand and uh, they're gonna serve you with that. This is important. I want everyone to participate. They're gonna give you a three by five card and a pencil. I'll give you just a moment. Okay, this is what I need you to do. I need you to write these five words on your card. I know how you feel. I need 100% participation on this. I know how you feel. I got an opening question. If you've ever been to the funeral of somebody that you've loved, please hold up your card. Just take a look around for a moment. Now I want you to look in the eyes of someone near you and exchange your card for theirs. I know how you feel. Question number two. If you or someone you know has ever been affected by cancer, please hold up your card. Nearly every hand. I need you to look in the eyes of someone that you have not already exchanged a card with and exchange your card. I know how you feel. Thank you. If you've ever suffered the consequences of addiction, either yourself or somebody close to you, please hold up your card. I want you to look in the eyes of someone that you've not already exchanged a card with and exchange your card. If you've ever stared at a stack of bills and thought, I have absolutely no idea how I'm going to pay these, I'm going to raise up your card. You know the drill. Look somebody in the eyes that you've not already exchanged a card with and exchange your card. One final question. If you or somebody you know has ever been affected by suicide, I want you to hold up your card. This time, I want you to exchange your card with somebody that you've not already exchanged your card with, and I want you to say out loud, I know how you feel.
here's the point of this exercise. There's presence, solidarity, strength, and healing when you find out that you're not alone. If you'd stand to your feet with me. We all suffer, but rarely at the same time. You're not alone, and others know how you feel. Normally, I would close in prayer as I pray over you, but I'd like you, if you would, to place your hand on the shoulder of someone near you. And as I pray, you're going to be praying with them. Father, I thank you for this local church, the expression of Jesus manifest in the body of Christ. As a point of contact, we lay hands on our friend, our neighbor, our relative, and in doing so, we're saying, I know how you feel, and you're not alone. God, may there be solidarity, strength, healing, and deliverance in this place that the relevance of this body, it's not in our political views. It's not in our opinions. It's in our ability to suffer together, to rejoice together, to be a strength when the other needs it, to be a spotter in life when life gets heavy, to relate to those who can relate to us. God, we thank you for the grace and the anointing, the ability to do this. In and of ourselves, we do not have it but we're not in and of ourselves. We are in the vine, branches connected, anointed by you to serve, to love, and to be a blessing. Help us to one another, another well. In Jesus' name, amen.